Well, good morning. Are you awake? Are you cold? It's not supposed to be 20-something degrees in Florida. And uh, I guess we're close enough to the north, Georgia, that uh, it gets a little cool. It's good to see you today. Glad you came to church. Are you happy? Would you rather be in jail? Hospital? No? Rather be at church? Well, notify your face you're happy and, you know, smile a little bit. Good to see you today. Let's stand together and uh, glad you came today. If it's your first time with us, there on the back of the pew, there's a little blue card that says, Welcome, friends, and uh, don't feel like an outsider. Don't even feel like a visitor. Just go ahead and call yourself a friend and uh, fill that out. Let us get to know you, and uh, you, can, you can hand it to anybody but you can also bring it to me when we're shaking hands or after the service. There's two boxes up front. Uh, we're a little different. During COVID, we started taking the offering in a box. I liked it so much, I never left it. So that's how we'll receive the offering later, and our folks are used to that. But it gives us a chance to fellowship, and uh, we enjoy that. But right now, we're going to join together and sing. There's nothing like him sing Friday night. We uh, Our auditorium seats, about 470... Five, and we had 520 people in here, and uh, it was just packed out, and I mean, singing the hymns, it, it's an unusual type of singing, but uh, the whole congregation singing together, and it was just great. Well, guess what? We get the opportunity to do it again this morning. So I want you to lift your voices, choir, I want you to sing so loud that you, I, I mean, it's okay, we'll fix the ceiling tiles. I want you to lift your voices. Let's worship the Lord today. Saints, Danny, let's sing Heaven's Jubilee. Let's sing it out on the first. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air. Coming after you and me, joy is ours to share. What rejoicing there will be when the saints shall rise. Heaven for that Jubilee, yonder in the sky.
If you were at the hymn sing on Friday night, we sang this song. It's one of my favorites. I must tell Jesus. Turn to page 115. Let's sing it out. I must tell Jesus all of my trials, and I cannot bear these burdens alone. And in my distress, He kindly will.
somebody say amen. amen. If you got Jesus, it ought to be well with your soul. Amen. amen. Uh, let, let's receive this morning's offering, and we're going to pray. We're going to fellowship, and uh, our folks, we... Uh, uh, I, I will call it the WJBC experience. I, I had somebody, I may have told y'all this, I had somebody tell me that was watching YouTube, they said, y'all's fellowship time's too long. Well, if y'all get off YouTube and come join us, you'd enjoy it. <laughs> it happens, of course, some people are watching videos, watching from other states, they can't get here, but, but uh, we fellowship and walk around and, and uh, are friendly and we give during this time. Uh, let me remind you to pray for Mandy Shelton to be having surgery on January 31st. Uh, Miss, Miss Alice Winnie uh, is in rehab now. Brother Paul got to go home, and so uh, you keep praying for them today as well. Brother Craig Sipe, lead us in prayer. Pray for the service. Let's give together. Let's fellowship together. Let's pray. Lord God, we're thankful for the day that we can say it is well with our soul. God, we thank you for saving us and providing for us and doing the work in our lives and our families and our community that only you can do. Lord, I thank you for Brother Paul and the message he brought this morning, Sunday school. God, we look forward to what you have for us in the hour to come. We pray that you just bless this place, bless the visitors that have come by today and our new friends, and just bless everything that's said and done. Now as bring, we bring your tithe and our offerings, God, we pray that you'd accept it at our hand, that it would be acceptable in your sight, and that you would take it, multiply it, and do with it what only you can do. We love you and thank you again for this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's sing I'll fly away some glad morning when this life is over I'll fly away to my home on God's celestial shore I'll fly away oh I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away in the morning when I die hallelujah bye bye I'll fly away Remain standing. Let's go to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. I introduced our theme for the year last week as we kicked off the year. Surrendered to the whatsoever. Now, you may take that as just a theme the pastor came up with. And you know what? You'd be right that I prayed about it and came up with it. But I want to make something clear to you. I'm challenging you. Up home, we'd say it this way, I'm double-dog daring you. <laughs> see somebody say, I dare you? No. If you say, I double-dog, you've got to think about it. You know, that's just the way it was at home. Uh, somebody told me one time, they said, you know, famous last words from you country guys is, hey, watch this. <laughs> that is not the famous last words. Mm-mm. Whoever told you that's wrong. The famous last words is, that ain't nothing, watch this. (laughs) It's the one that reacts that gets in trouble. And my theme this year is, the best way I could put it in my country vernacular, is I'm challenging you, daring you, to take up this theme this year. We always want our way, and... We're in stewardship month, and and we always are in January. It's a different year, a little different schedule. Missionaries coming through. Brother Paul's with us today. Stewardship fellowships next Sunday night. It's a little early. Uh, First fruit Sunday, Brother Ralph's going to be preaching. We're still going to have our commitment that morning, but it's just all a little different, but that's okay. The fact is, we'll still have all tithe and all that, but before we know it, I want you to hear me, church. Before we know it, 2024 is going to be gone. It's going to fly by and we're going to go, well, there goes another year. What's your theme this year, preacher? I wonder if we could have some folks have enough backbone, have enough love for God, that you'd say, God, I will surrender my life to your whatsoever. Whatever you have for me, I'll surrender. And I want you to read with me this morning. And uh, I want us to look at verse 6 of Joshua 14. The children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses the servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. Now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. And he said, These forty and five years, ever since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old, as yet I am... As strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Caleb, talking to Joshua, says this, verse 12, Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the 
the Kenizzite unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kerjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. This is not in my sermon, but I want you to understand, Hebron is where the patriarchs are buried. This is prime land, and here the giants were there. And I'm going to preach today on the whatsoever mountain, the whatsoever mountain. Father, help me today as I preach. Give me liberty, loose my mouth, loose my, loose my mind. Help me to preach what you'd have me to preach. But God, my message is of no value unless you use it to do work in a heart. And Lord, unless the people in the pew are willing to listen and make a decision for you, then Lord, we didn't come today to be changed. Lord, don't just stir us today. Change us. And let us leave here different than we came in, closer to you. Lord, if there's someone here today on their way to hell, I pray today they'd change directions by your power and be on their way to heaven. Bless the song now. Help me to preach in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated.
Well, amen. God has done some great things for us here at West Jacksonville Baptist Church over the years. This coming summer, we will uh, celebrate uh, 70 years as a church. Uh, you can go ahead and put it down. July 28th, if you miss that day, you're going to kind of regret it. And uh, that's the last Sunday in, in uh, July, and uh, it's our 70th year. I, I, I look at our church, and I say, boy, God, God has just, just blessed us, and um, I, I believe we could say with the psalmist, Psalm 126.3, the Lord hath done great things for us, wherefore we are glad. Anybody glad this morning? Amen. Anybody just a little bit glad? I mean, some of you, I told you at the beginning of the service, you need to notify your face. Because some of you, some, I can tell it was cold this morning when we got up, because some of you, stand. it's not cold in here now. Matter of fact, up here it's pretty warm, but, but uh, I, God's been good to us, and we ought to act like He's been good. I, I wonder if we live like we believe God's been good. Do we live like God has been good to us? Well, uh, we, we love to talk about the goodness of God. We love to sing about the goodness of God. I want to ask you, how much do you live in the goodness of God? Or do you live in the flesh? You see, Caleb, Caleb was a different kind of man. Uh, this story is not an unfamiliar story to someone who has read their Bible. And if you've not read your Bible a lot, this is going to be a brand new story. It's an, um, an amazing story, and I'm going to tell some of it. But Caleb has been in the battles now himself since they left Egypt, which would be uh, many years before, be about uh, 46, 47 years and, and here he's 85 years old. He has looked at Joshua, and he makes this statement. And I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it. He says, Joshua, I'll take that mountain now. He said, Joshua, I, I, I'll take that mountain now. I'll take, I, I'll take that, that place, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But it would be hard. A battle was going to be necessary. Here's an 85-year-old man saying, I think I'll go fight a little bit more. Don't think I'm going to quit right now. I I think I'm going to go fight. He said, there's something that belongs to me. There's something that's been promised to me. And he said, I think I'm going to do that. He wasn't complacent. Let me tell you what he did. Caleb was a man who had surrendered to the whatsoever in his life. He had surrendered to the whatsoever. And so in this, we're going to see that whatsoever. What was his whatsoever? You see, if I went through the Scriptures, I, I, I look. And uh, wish the Lord to loose me preach this morning. Because I look at a man like Abraham in an unknown land. God told Abraham, I want you to get up and leave where your family is. And I'm going to tell you where to go. And do you realize Abraham had a whatsoever that he had to go somewhere he didn't even know where he was going. He had a whatsoever land. Joshua had a whatsoever leadership. Joshua was going to take on the, the, after Moses was there, and of course Moses, I, I could have talked about him doing the whatsoever, and Moses an amazing person, but I think about Joshua having to follow Moses, and he had to say, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to obey God, I'm going to have to lead this people. You know, for, for 40 years, Joshua heard the people murmur, he heard them complain, he saw them die. And then Moses died. And he's told before Moses died, all this going to be yours someday. I'm sure he felt like that. Have y'all ever seen one of those pictures of a garage that's a hoarder? And they have packed it from the floor to the ceiling. You open the door, and if you could cut the house off, it would be in the shape of the room. And you see this dad open the garage and the son come up and he looks at him. He says, son, someday all this is going to be yours. I think Joshua probably felt a little bit like that. Because he's he's seen all the problems. But you know what Joshua said? He said, I'll surrender to the whatsoever. Well, the story goes back a little bit further and it's mentioned in our text. But it goes back and, and we'll put it on the screen. You'll have to turn there. You stay in Joshua 14. But I want to talk to you a little bit about Numbers 14. Because you see, Caleb could remember the cowardice. He could remember what happened. He could remember the cowardice. 
You see, there was a mission of reconnaissance that was made. Uh, Moses took 12 men, and these 12 men risked their life to go into the promised land. I mean, God had promised this land to them. And so they took their lives in their hands, and they went into the land to espy or to spy out the land. They go into the land, they look at it, and they go, wow, look at the fruit here. Look at those grapes. Look at those fertile fields. Look at all the flowers. Look at all the places where the cattle can graze and the bees can make their honey. This is a land where milk and honey will flow. This is a land that it'll have all the provision that's ever needed. Boy, isn't this great? And the grapes of Eskel. Wow. Can you believe it's this good? Can you believe it's this great? The land had plenty. It was just what God promised until they got to the mountains. They'd seen the valleys, and they're looking, they're going, boy, this is great, exactly what God said, and they get to those mountains, and there be giants there. There were warriors there that brought fear. Oh, David and Goliath was nothing. Twelve men against a thousand giants is what they saw. And they got scared. And all of a sudden, the giant was bigger than God. All of a sudden, what God had promised them didn't matter because there was giants. So this land of plenty became a land of promise or problems because of giants. They didn't believe God. Psalm 106 described it this way. Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word, but murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore, he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness. They, they, they go on this mission of reconnaissance, and then they come back and they give a mixed report. Yeah, it's, it looks good. There's giants. They're bigger than we are. That we can't do this, and so they begin to murmur. Numbers 14, only rebel not against the Lord. Verse 9, they're told, don't rebel. They start murmuring. They despise God's plan. Now, go back and look at Numbers 14 too. Look at this. Look on the screen. It says, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. Now, here's an interesting thing to me here that I'm just looking at, because this is how we are. Y'all realize that Moses and Aaron didn't go on that trip? They were not one of the 12. And, and here they are, the children of Israel is going, well, Moses and Aaron just want to kill us. And it says, and the whole congregation said unto them, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? They, they, they begin to complain and they disregarded the promise of God. Psalm 106 says they forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. They refused to surrender, listen to me, they refused to surrender to the whatsoever. The giant got their attention more than God, and, and, and I'm about to say something that I hope you'll open your ears and listen to me, because this is where most of us get in trouble. Their disobedience became convenient. Have you failed God because your disobedience was easier than obedience? Because guess what? Disobedience usually is easier. Disobedience usually is what our flesh wants. It's what we want. And so their disobedience became convenient, and they despised God's plan. But the amazing thing, give me that verse again. Put, put Numbers 14 back up there, number, verse 2, if you can find it. No, Numbers 14, 2, the previous verse, please. Look at the end of this verse. Would God that we'd died in Egypt? I, 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 we want Egypt. Numbers 14, 4. Now let's show that one. And they said one to another, let us make a captain. Let's forget Moses. Let's, hey, listen, God's given us Moses and Aaron, delivered us. We've seen 10 plagues. We've seen God deliver us. We've seen the Red Sea open. We've seen God destroy the army of Pharaoh. 
And now there's some giants over there in that land he's promised us, so let's make us a captain, and let's go back to Egypt where Pharaoh wants us dead. You know what? We, we miss them hitting us with the whips. Let's go back. We miss making bricks without straw. That was so much fun. Let's make us a captain and return to Egypt. They said, let's, now, now you say, preacher, that's kind of crazy. It's no different than a child of God who has called on the name of Jesus and asked him to save them to say, I'd rather live in the world than live for God. You'd rather go back to the slavery of your sin? You'd rather go back to the defeat of your sin? You'd rather go back to the misery of your sin from which God has delivered you? You'd rather do that? Because that's how most people live. You say, preacher, why do people do that? Because they're not surrendered to the whatsoever. They don't surrender to what, whatsoever God has for them. They want whatsoever they want. Now, I know it's, I, I know it's a, little, a, a little quiet this morning. But it's a little quiet this morning because either because you're still cold in your head. You ain't cold in the building. But you're either cold in the head or you're thinking to yourself, he's on that whatsoever stuff again. But you're going to hear it a little more. Hope he does. Listen to him. They said, give us our bonds, give us our slavery, give us the whips on our back. And they said this, give us our burdens instead of a battle. We'd rather be enslaved than to take what God's given us. God help us. Numbers 14, the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us unto this land. This is Joshua and Caleb, and give it us. These are the two that had faith, the land that floweth milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not, but all the congregation bade stone them. Stone them with stones. We don't want to hear them anymore. They wanted to kill now Joshua and Caleb. They've turned against Moses and Aaron, and so two of the 12 would survive. God now judges. There's a misery of God's ruling. God now judges them, and God's going to tell them, for every day that you spied out the land, you went, you went 40 days. Now, he did count the days of the two years in Kadesh Barnea, but he said, this wilderness where you've been, you went 40 days, fine, 40 years. That's the judgment. That's the verdict, 40 years. And everybody here that's under, that, that's 20 years old and older, you're going to die and rot in this wilderness. You will never get the promises of God. Now, don't you think that they all went to hell? Some of them believed in the true God. But, you see, their dreams died in the wilderness. You can be a child of God and have your dreams die because you don't obey God. Now, I don't believe, I don't believe, now, here's, here's a real problem. You've heard me preach this before. I believe in the eternal security of a saved person, uh, an eternal security of the believer. You say, preach, what are you saying? Well, some people criticize it by calling it once saved, always saved. And they don't teach the doctrine correctly. Now, I believe biblically I can show you that to be absolutely true. But here's the problem. The promise of eternal salvation or eternal security has never belonged to someone who's never been saved. And so somebody comes along and they have a false profession of faith. They're not saved. They've had a religious experience, but they've never placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They, they, they played church. They think they're going to heaven because grandmama was a Christian or because granddaddy was a Christian and, and, or maybe even granddaddy was a preacher and they think I'm okay. Or I've heard stories before somebody would say, well, you know, preacher, I went through this storm one time and I saw a light out of heaven, so I must be saved. No, if you hadn't called on the name of Jesus and believed with your heart according to the Scriptures, you're lost. There's not a preacher that will stand in the pulpits around this world today that is saved because he's preaching. I am redeemed today by love divine because there was a day I called on the name of G Jesus and I believed with my heart that God had raised him from the dead and he saved me. He birthed me into the family. 
He, I've been, I have been born, or as we'd say out in the country, I've been born again. I have been born again. I have been birthed into the family of God. And once I was birthed into the family of God, I cannot be unborn. But if you've never been born, you can talk like you're in the family. You can look like you're in the family. You can act like you're in the family. You can say you're in the family. But if you haven't been born again and saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're not in the family. You're not there. So there were some in Israel, I believe, that had rejected the, the Passover. And, and, of course, the firstborn died in that. I believe there were some in Israel that was in the wilderness had rejected God's ways. And they didn't believe by faith. But some of them that died in the wilderness, they had believed. But their dreams all died in the wilderness. Now, listen to me a minute. If you reject as God's child to live according to his whatsoever... There are some dreams that God has for you that will never come to pass. There are some promises of God you'll never see in this life because you chose your way instead of God's way. I don't know how to preach that any more clear to Christians. We live in such a lazy, and I know I'm, I know I'm, I'm, I'm saying things that you're not going to hear many preachers say, but you know what? One day I'm going to stand before God. I'm not going to stand before you. And I'm going to give an account to God. We live in a day of lazy Christianity. We want to we tell everybody we're right with God, but we're not willing to pay the price to be right with God. Now, you hear me. You don't do anything for your salvation. Nothing. Nothing. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Can you imagine how we'd act if we had something to do with our salvation? I did it. You didn't do anything. I don't know who said this. I read it recently. If we could lose our salvation, we would. We're incapable of saving ourselves. Anybody with me? Y'all agree? Okay. But the problem is we get so lazy that since Jesus paid it all, we want, it, we want to make sure that we just relax and live in spiritual luxury. We don't want it to cost us anything. Your salvation doesn't cost you anything. But if you're going to live for Jesus, it's going to cost you something. You say, what's it going to cost me, preacher? Different things, but you can put it under one category whatsoever. Are we willing? Now, for Caleb, it was a mountain of whatsoever. So we got Joshua and Caleb. We've got 38 more years that passed. Two years in Kadesh Barnea. 38 more years passed. They're in the wilderness in some of the land. Is that they have now gone into the land, they've crossed Canaan. I'm going to jump ahead in the story. They cross, they cross into Canaan, they cross the Jordan River. Where they cross the Jordan River, just, I mean, literally, directly to the east of them was a mountain called Mount Nebo. Up on top of that mountain, and if you'll read your Bible, you'll find out this is true. The Bible says that Moses died on Nebo over against Jericho. And where they crossed the Jordan River to go into Canaan is just south of Jericho. When you stand up on top of Mount Nebo, you can see into the Holy Land, just like the Bible says. Yeah, uh, we, we were standing there about a year and a half ago, and, and uh, I was standing there, and I'm looking at it, and I could see the spot where we go to that we, look, that, that we commemorate the baptism of Jesus. The same place where the children of Israel crossed the Jordan. I could see Jericho off in the distance. You realize your Bible is that true? That you can go to your Bible and literally see? Other religious books don't have that validity. But the Bible's that true. And so now they've crossed into Israel, what is today Israel. They've crossed into the Holy Land. And, and, and they have done what they're supposed to do. And they have fought now for a few years. Remember, Caleb could remember the cowardice. Second thing I want you to understand. Is Caleb now made a request of confidence. Verses 8 and 9, go back to our text in Joshua uh, chapter 14. Caleb is 85 years old, and he's been fighting with everybody else. By his own confession, he's just as strong as eight, at 85 as he was at 45. He, he was just as strong, and, 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 and he, was, he was fighting, 
He had done everything. He did not desire the cities. Listen, they, they'd gone through. And if, you, if I could take you to the Holy Land, there are some places in the Holy Land easier to get to. There's some beautiful valleys. Oh, you get over there on, on the Valley of Jezreel where Megiddo is and where the, the Battle of Armageddon is going to take place. And you go stand up in Megiddo where Solomon kept his horses. And, of course, it's that hill of Megiddo, Har Megiddo, where we get the term Armageddon from. And, and you stand up on that hill and you look out across that fertile plain. You stand up on Mount Carmel where, where uh, Elijah stood against the prophets of Baal. And you look out and you see all the fertile land. You look off in the distance and you see Mount Tabor. And you look over to the left and you see the precipice where Nazareth sits and where they were going to throw Jesus off headlong. And for too long you get up there to, the, to the, the Sea of Galilee and you talk about a place that's pretty. You come across and you see that Sea of Galilee and you see all the fertile plains all around the Sea of Galilee. And you know, up north of the Sea of Galilee is where the tribe of Dan was. And you'll see in the Bible from Dan to Beersheba, Dan was the furthest point north. Beersheba was the furthest point south. And so it was easy to say, hey, I want those places that are easy. Give me, and Florida, Floridians would understand this. Give me the flat land. Highest elevation we have around here is a bridge. I mean, it's just flat. You get up where I'm from, and, and y'all know this, we've got the rolling hills at the, the, just the bottom of the App, App, Appalachian Mountains. And, and you got those rolling, but then you go a little bit further north, and it starts getting taller and higher. And you get up into the Great Smoky Mountains. You go just a little bit, not far, you go just a little bit east of there, and you get where Brother Paul's from. And not too far from him, you can go get on that parkway. Boy, it's pretty. And you see those mountains. Well, see, we have something called cars. We drive up those hills. Unless you're like George Lugenbill and crazy enough to walk up those hills. Hope he's listening. And, 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 and so the thing is, everybody's wanting the easy land. An 85-year-old man who had believed the promises of God as much or more than anybody in the nation of Israel had been born a slave. Yeah. He was born in Egypt, and when he was born in Egypt, he woke up as a baby, never knew anything but slavery. He saw God's deliverance. He, he beheld God's power. I thought about Colossians 1.13, because you realize everybody that's never been saved is still in the slavery of sin. And Colossians says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And so he had been delivered. He had beheld God's power. Like I told you a moment ago, he saw the Red Sea open. Can you imagine that? I was down on the Red Sea when I was one of our missionaries in Egypt. And I'm looking at that. And I'm going, well, that's just amazing that God, and, and God didn't just open the Red Sea. He let them walk over on dry ground. I, I mean, I, I don't even know how to explain this, but anybody that's ever waded and fished or anything, y'all going to know what I'm talking about. When you wade and you put your feet down, it, it can be kind of mushy. You can go ankle deep. I've gone knee deep. I mean, it can be. They didn't, none of that. When God rolled the waters back, God not only rolled the waters back, he sucked all the moisture out of the ground. They walked, the Bible says they walked across on dry land. You understand, Caleb witnessed this. Caleb saw when they got to Marah and they didn't have water, and he saw Moses obey God and cut a tree, and that tree fall into that water and make the water sweet. Caleb saw that. Caleb saw their journey all the way. Caleb saw when Moses brought them the law in Exodus chapters 20 through verse 32. He saw the nation of Israel fall in idolatry. He saw God punish. He saw people die in the wilderness. He saw every bit of this. And finally, they get to Kadesh Barnea, and he gets to be the one from his tribe to go spy out the land. And he goes and he sees the land. He sees the giants. He sees everything that happens. He, he, he knew what it was like to eat manna. Krispy Kreme donuts on the ground. No, 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 I'm just joking. But he saw what it was like to eat God's provision of manna. He saw these things. 
And the whole time, the whole time, God help me, I don't know if I've lived up to this. The whole time, Caleb just believed God. If you're in chapter 14, say amen. Look at verse 9. Caleb looked at Joshua and said, Moses, swear on that day, saying, Surely the I am whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. He remembered. Now that came from Numbers 14, 24. But my servant Caleb, because he hath an over their spirit with him, hath followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed shall possess it. Caleb took God at his word. Caleb didn't have to tell God what God said. You don't ever have to look in heaven and say, God, remember you said this? God always knows what he said. The problem is we don't know what he said. God help us. But you realize that 38 years before, God would have given them the land, but they didn't take it. And so Caleb looks up into heaven and looks at Joshua and says, God, do it now. I'll take the whatsoever mountain now. Because you see, he remembered the cowardice. He made a request of confidence, and now in verses 10 through 12, he reveals a resolve of courage. Now he looks at the mountain. Now here's what's been going on. Understand this. Caleb has been fighting with everybody else to help them get their inheritance. He does not have his inheritance yet. His family is not taken care of. He has been fighting and, and serving and helping everybody else get their land. And he looks at Josh when he said, it's my turn. Verse 11. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. Verse 12. Now therefore. Now I want you to notice some closer. Are you looking at it? Say amen. Look at it. Now therefore. Give me this mountain. He did not look at, at Joshua and say, give me one of the mountains. He didn't look at Joshua and say, you know, it'd be okay with you. I'd like to have a place with a view. Uh-uh. You know what he asked for? Don't you think? Remember all those people whining because the giants were there? And they wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb. And they wanted to go against Moses and Aaron. And they wanted to get a captain. And they wanted to go back to Egypt because there were giants in the land. You know what Caleb said? Joshua, you remember that's where they live. Give me this mountain. I want the whatsoever mountain. I don't want just any mountain. I want that mountain. I want the one nobody else. Listen, Caleb said, give me what nobody else wanted. I want the whatsoever mountain. He said, give me this mountain. Give me where the giants are. Give me where the problems are. Give me where the trouble is. That's what I want. God, show yourself true in my life and give me what nobody else wanted. I want the whatsoever mountain. Caleb reveals his courage as he remembers that failure. He requested now a fight. He wasn't discouraged. He said, I'm ready. I can handle it. First Timothy 2, no man worth uh, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. He said, I'm ready. Verse 12, he said, I'm able. Huh. Verse 12, he said, give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest that day how the Anakims were there. Were there. Those giants were there. He said, I want where the giants live. Sometimes when I think of a mountain view, there's nothing like a mountain view. The Stradleys are probably watching. I hope y'all enjoying the mountain view. They, they, they live up in Georgia. They watch the services every week. But Caleb's mountain wasn't like their mountain. His mountain was full of the enemy. He didn't want that mountain. He, you hear me. I want you to get this in your mind, and I want you to brand it in your mind. Caleb did not want a mountain because it was convenient. 
Caleb did not want a mountain because it was comfortable. Caleb did not want that mountain because of the view. Caleb didn't want that mountain because it was prime land. Caleb wanted that mountain because that very mountain was the reason that people didn't obey God. And he said, I set out to obey God, and I'm going to obey God to the fullest. Give me that whatsoever mountain. Give me that place where the giants were. Give me that place nobody else wants. I'll take it. I'm 85. Some of our older people listen to me. It's not time for you to quit. Caleb didn't. You say, well, preacher, I don't feel like I was 45. I feel your pain. But you can still serve God. Caleb asked for where the giants live, and then what did he do? Uh, let's just put it up on the screen for him. Joshua 15, 14. This is what happens. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak. You remember Anakims were there? He drove thence the three sons of Anak. An 85-year-old man went up and whipped the giants. I, I, I mean, he, he goes up, he whips the children of the giants. Here's the amazing thing. The giants they had seen 38 years before were dead. But their kids were still there. And Caleb took that mountain, and it became his inheritance. And then the last thing happened. Caleb remembered the time that there was cowardice. He requested, he made a request of confidence. He revealed a resolve of courage. And lastly, Caleb rested in the reward of his commitment. Two weeks we'll make our commitments, and sometimes we do it out of routine. Everybody in this room is going to spend eternity somewhere. Everybody. And if you know the Lord, you're going to spend eternity with the Lord. And you're not, your sin, if you know the Lord, your sin's not judged because the Lord has redeemed you from that penalty. But He is going to judge us of how we live and how we serve Him. How... Will we face heaven? Will we see the reward of our commitments? I like rewards. Anybody with me? How, how many of y'all? Come on, don't lie. If, if, if today, this afternoon, if I told you there was a restaurant this afternoon, that if we got there, they were going to reward everybody this afternoon with a free meal uh, of filet mignon, baked potato, uh, whatever other vegetable you'd like to have as long as it's not broccoli. And, and uh, 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 but, but, I mean, if you like broccoli or if you like those little round rotten cabbages, you can have them if that's what you like. That's just not going to be mine. But there's a restaurant going to give you filet mignon, baked potato, whatever vegetable you want, and a big old bowl of homemade banana pudding with vanilla wafers in it. And I mean, just good stuff. And they're going to give you that. And then right next to your food, they're going to give you $100. You know what my problem is? There's somebody in this room right now that did not hear me say I was making that up. And you're sitting there thinking, preacher, where's that at? I know how it is because you're just halfway listening. I'm, that, that wasn't true. Did everybody hear me say it's not true? I don't know anybody that's going to do that. But if there was a place like that, I'd have a hard time keeping you here because some of you folks get out on the day after Thanksgiving at, at an hour that there ain't no reason to be up at, that early, and you'll go stand in line at a store to get a TV for $200 off. We like rewards. Now, your preacher's tight. I like to get something for a cheap price. I do. But there's not a single reward when I stand before God that's going to be on sale. There's not rewards in heaven that I'm getting at a discount. These eternal rewards are going to be rewards that for, were for people that were willing to surrender to the whatsoever. A man like Caleb that said, nobody else wants the mountain. Give me the whatsoever mountain. And you know what? He got it. He obeyed faithfully. I thought to myself this morning, I, 
Brother Paul, I didn't listen to you. I teach Sunday school every week, and I rarely get to go sit in my office and go over my message. And today I said, Paul's got this. I'm going to go sit in my office and go over my message. While I was going over it, I wrote this down. This is just my thought this morning as I was preaching to myself before I preached to you. Do we lack God's blessings because we seek His promises more than we seek Him? Numbers 14, 24, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, hath followed me fully. Caleb didn't get his mountain because he wanted the mountain. Caleb got his mountain because he wanted his God. I don't, I don't know where Caleb's buried, but if we could find it, we would see a tombstone. Not really, I'm saying if, it, if, if we did what we do today in our culture, we'd have a tombstone, and on his tombstone we would put, he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. That's what we would do. Think about it, fighting for years, nobody else wanted the mountain, and Caleb said, I'll take the whatsoever. He said, hey, Joshua, give me this mountain. Give me the one where we saw the giants. Give me the trouble. Give me the problems. Give me the pain. Give me the hurt. He said, I'm going to go conquer that mountain, and then I'm going to give it to my kids. And he said, my kids are going to remember that God did something big in this spot. I want to close with a different verse. Colossians 3.23, but it sums up everything. I want you to leave that up for a minute because I want to talk about it. Paul wrote this, and I believe this verse in the New Testament describes Caleb. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. Now, let's just be honest. Don't raise your hand. But how many times have we said what we've said or done what we've done because we want to please somebody here? Sure, we've done that. How often do we stop and say, God, does this please you? But I, I want you to notice a word here. Because I'm, I'm talking about us surrendering to the whatsoever. I'm talking about Caleb taking a whatsoever mountain. I'm looking at this verse, and, and it has it in there, whatsoever you do, do. So the, the whatsoever do's there. But when I was studying, and this is what led me to the whole sermon, this word heartily. Now, if you'll go get your Strong's Concordance and look up this word, you'll find out that this one English word is two Greek words. Now, I'm going to get a little deep for a minute, but I want you to listen to me. Watch me and listen to me. It's two Greek words. And, 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 and I looked at them, and, and it's not translated wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But the first word means out of. The second Greek word is the Greek word for the soul. A synonym of that word is the word breath. This verse is literally saying, whatsoever you do, do it out of your existence before God. We see it and say, well, do your best. That is not what that verse means. It's even weakening the verse to say, give it all you got. That's weak. Spurgeon one time was, had a man come in, a young man come in his office and told Spurgeon that he wanted the power of the Holy Spirit on his life. And the story that I read said that Spurgeon told him, they walked out of Metropolitan Tabernacle there in London and Spurgeon walked him down to a creek. I don't know if it was on the Thames or if it, where it was, but he walked him down to a body of water that was outside his church office. And he said he took that young man and he walked out into the water and that young man, now, I mean, if, I, if, if, I'm in, if I'm in my normal clothes and I walk out in the water, you might as well go with me because something's about to happen. Spurgeon walked out in that water, took that young boy with him. And he reached over before that young boy realized what he's doing. He grabbed that young boy and he put him under the water and held him there. 
Now, if somebody grabs you and puts you under the water, that's going to shock you to begin with. Anybody with me? Okay. And he's holding him under the water. Well, he trusted Spurgeon, so right at first it shocked him, so he just stopped for a minute. But Spurgeon kept holding him under the water. Well, before too long, anybody knows what happened? I mean, you, you, you're thinking, no, this is not right here. I'm fixing to die. This preacher trying to kill me. And all of a sudden, he started flaying his arms, kicking his legs, doing everything he could do, and then Spurgeon lifting him up. And he said, when you want the Spirit of God's power on you as much as you just wanted breath, God will give it to you. I'm not going to say in our day and age that would be the best illustration. <laughs> but it does prove a point. And that is what the word heartily means. It means out of your breath, out of your soul. There's nothing fake about this. There's nothing plastic about this. There's nothing synthetic about this. Paul said, whatsoever you do, peel back all those layers. And out of every fiber of your soul, do it for God. I dare you. That's what Paul said. I mean, Paul puts a dare down. He said, whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Do it out of your soul. Do it with every fiber of your existence. Surrender to the whatsoever. There was good reason to live for God. How many of y'all believe with me the Bible? How many of y'all believe the Bible? Say amen. How many of y'all believe with me that Caleb took that mountain? He did, didn't he? Didn't he? Well, could I tell you, and I'm done, there's a reason I do what I do, and it's not because I love you, but I wasn't called to preach just to preach here. God's left me here a long time, and I appreciate you putting up with me. But I surrendered to preach to the Lord. Why? Well, as a child... I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he saved me. You say, why? Well, there was a mountain that nobody else could conquer. And before the foundation of the world, the Son of God stepped forward and said, Father, give me this mountain. I sure am glad that Jesus had a whatsoever mountain. I sure am glad that he said, Father, I'll take that mountain of Calvary. A mountain that nobody else could conquer. A mountain where the payment of the giants of my sin loomed heavy. Because you couldn't pay for my sin. And I couldn't pay for my sin. If I had died on that cross of Calvary, you and I both would have gone to hell. Because it had nothing to do with that cross. It had to do with who owned the cross. And it had to do with who faced that mountain. Preacher, why should I say I'll take whatsoever mountain? Well, if you're saved today, you're only saved because Jesus did that exact thing. And he took a mountain that nobody else could defeat and died and rose again. But listen to me, man. I love this thought. Caleb asked for his mountain for his inheritance. Jesus conquered his for mine. Jesus already owned everything. Jesus already owned it all. He said, I want Rodney to be in heaven with me. But he can't come here like he is. I got to change him. So he was born in Bethlehem, grew up, and he went to Calvary heartily for my inheritance. Luke 23. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. The malefactors, one on the right hand, other on the left. And Jesus paid for my redemption heartily. So if you're redeemed today, how could you not say, God, I'll surrender all. Don't lie. But if you're truly God's child, how could you not say, Lord, here's my life. I, whatsoever I'll do. 
Give me my whatsoever mountain. I'll surrender to the whatsoever. And I want to say this plainly and I'm done. If you're here right now, or you're watching on YouTube, or you're listening live on the radio, and you somehow convinced yourself that you're going to heaven because you're good, or you're going to heaven because of religion, or you're going to heaven because of any other reason you can name other than a genuine relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, I'm not sure what that relationship is. Then you're probably not saved. I'm not trying to scare you. I want me and you both to go to heaven together. But more than I want it, Jesus paid for it. There'd be no reason to preach anything I preach if I didn't give you the message that Jesus wants you to be in his family. If you'll believe in him, he'll save you today. Saved? Will you take the whatsoever? Lost? Will you trust Christ? Let's bow in prayer. I don't know what your need is today, and we don't have long invitations. Many are already slipping out to pray. There's probably, I don't know what all the needs are, but if you have a need, you want to bring it to the Lord. Don't you even hesitate. You're, You're free to come. You're free to come. If you're here today and you'd say, Preacher, I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want you to meet me right here and let me have somebody take God's word. We're not going to give you our opinion. We're going to show you what the Bible says. You can leave here. You can leave here not just my friend. You can leave here my brother or my sister. Because you can be in the same family I'm in. If you'll just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now with heads bowed, eyes closed. I rarely do it this way. I do it this way when the Lord pricks my heart. And I feel like I'm supposed to. Just in case so I know you're coming. I don't want anybody looking. I want everybody's eyes closed. Everybody, close your eyes. Nobody looking. Is anybody here you'd say, Preacher, I'm one of those people that's not sure I'm saved. I'm not coming to get you. I'm not going to embarrass you. This just means you talking. You say, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. Up in the balcony or down on this first floor, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. You may have been in church 100 years. But you'd say, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. Hold your hand up just long enough for me to see it. Put it back down. Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Somebody else. You say, Preacher, I'm not sure. Let me know. You don't have to tell nobody else. Just tell me. Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm religious. But I'm not sure if I died today or if the rapture took place and Jesus took the church home. Thank you. I'm not sure I'm saved. Two, anybody else? Anybody else want to be honest? Preach, I'm not sure I'm saved. And I never, y'all know me, I hardly ever do this. But I felt compelled in my spirit to do it this way. Those that, those that looked at, that, that raised your hand, I don't want anybody looking. I want those two to look at me. And I'm not going to come get you. I love both of you. And I believe there's some others here, if it's honest, they'd come too. But I got some guys that'll take the Bible and go pray with you in a room in the back. We ain't making a spectacle. We ain't talking about numbers. I want you to go to heaven. And if you got the guts to come when we stand up, I'm going to have somebody take the Bible and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. You don't have to live in doubt today anymore. You can be saved today. And when we stand up, I'm not going to come get you. I'm going to ask you to meet me. And I'm going to meet you right here. And I'm going to pray in just a minute. Some of you others, you say, preacher, I'm saved, but I'm not right with God. You don't have to tell the preacher anything. I'm not your priest. You come down here, get in an altar, and tell God where you're at. Call on Jesus today. Let's stand together. And as we sing, would you come?